Welcome to another edition of Fronteras. I'm Hector H. Lopez. We've been having a series of discussions about how America is indeed changing over the course of the last shows that I've had with all of you. We've had an active discussion about all the various workings of a community. We've talked about education on our last show uh, where we were together. We talked with Vincent Perez and the staff of Congressman Silvestre Reyes about uh, their own experiences educationally. We've talked about the debt ceiling and the frustrations of people uh, when it comes to politics in their community. And all of these things really pointing to a change in the status quo of our communities. And we've kind of been hinting at a lot of different changes at Fronteras. The very title of our show, Fronteras, A Changing America, denotes that there is an active shift ongoing within the community in the United States of America. Joining us today, I'm pretty excited uh, because I have a very good friend of mine, Dr. Joseph Villescas of Villescas Research Media and Instruction, uh, who's actually, we went to high school together, and uh, Joseph and I have, uh, uh, you know, known each other for quite some time. But Joseph has also been doing some significant work regarding the very topic that we've been having here at Fronteras. We've been uh, discussing all these changes in the community. Uh, Joseph, for, his, for quite some time, has been actively involved in kind of researching where America is headed. What kind of educational hurdles do we have to clear in the next few years? What kind of leadership hurdles do we have to clear in the next few years? Uh, Dr. Joseph Viescas has been uh, a member of faculty and staff at the University of Texas at El Paso. He's he had taught some courses out there. He's also been the vice president of research for the National Hispanic Institute, uh, an organization with, with which, of course, I'm uh, personally affiliated with as its own senior vice president. Uh, and now Joseph is heading up his own research media and instruction uh, organization, Viescas Research Media and Instruction. And, and today he joins us to talk a little bit about uh, some research that we've been talking about for some years, Joseph. First of all, welcome to the show. Thank you, Hector. And uh, you, you've been talking about some some research for over the course of, it's it's almost going to be, we're inching towards, I mean, it's our eighth years that we've been talking about, inching towards mm -hmm. 10 years of talking about the perfect storm. And it's one of my perfect, it's one of, it's one of those pieces of research that uh, really captivates, well, it certainly captivated my mind mm -hmm. uh, when I first read it. And uh, we've been talking about it for close to eight years now, and we're beginning to see some trends now that are, that are very interesting. Tell folks a little bit about how the perfect storm began and, and, and what it's all about, because I'm sure people are talking about, well, what is he talking about, meteorology? Uh, is he talking about, no, I'm sure uh, you're not talking about that. Well, no, I think even the title dates itself, because uh, 2003 was much closer to the release of the film, A Perfect Storm, which is where three giant you know, hurricanes collide. Yeah. And in the vortex, George Clooney and Marky Mark have to actually face certain death. <laughs> um, for us, when we were talking about the situation, we were definitely aware that there were some assumptions yeah. about who was coming next into the Latino community as its new wave of leadership. I mean, NHI plays a role in that. Uh, but that discussion was then being contextualized by yourself and myself and our colleague, uh, Julio Cotto in particular, uh, during that era, uh, and Alex Diaz, and I could, I could go on and name a few others, Dominic Gonzalez. Um, and we were trying to recognize how, well, what if you look at the educational factors and how we're doing in pre-K through 12, undergrad and grad school, and our success in completing degrees, you look at all of those, and then you look at the age distribution of our population, and then you talk about the shifting demographic within Latino subpopulations, going from a generational Mexican-American community primarily into a foreign-born immigrant, heavily immigrant population, um, and exploding during the 90s and, and around the time that we were talking about. We hadn't really seen the total uh, picture yet, but we were seeing a storm move in from here and a storm move in from there. And then the biggest one that I think our, our mentor, uh, the president of the National Hispanic Institute, Ernesto, was, was definitely helping us to become very critically aware, mm -hmm. was that the baby boomers are about to retire. And from the Chicano leaders of yesteryear to some of our most senior elected officials, we are dealing with a mainly male population uh, who were born in the 40s, possibly the 50s, yeah. and uh, were entrepreneurial, were civically oriented, were community organizers. I mean, they did all kinds of things, but ultimately, these extraordinary leaders, this small number who at the time were saving either 2 million or 6 million or 10 million Latino constituents, now, you know, if you're into office on a national level, you'd be serving 50 million or more. Plus, well, let's, people. let's yeah. flash back here a little bit. We, we, when we were back, back in those days, when you began this, this particular research piece of the perfect storm, 
the big the big headlines everywhere was you know the growth the boom of the Latino Hispano community. In fact, back then, I mean, entire parades were thrown about you know oh my gosh the Latino community is moving on up. We have population but growth all over. If you the look country. back, it was a turf war. It was a dispute that was actually saying, look, look, America, you all of you out there who deal with a black white racial paradigm in your mind, a binary of race relations in the country. As of the year 2000, because of the new system of racial classification and the tremendous immigration and fertility within the Latino uh, population in 1999, 2000, there was a moment yeah. where the Latino community eclipsed the African American community. That's why it was so big. So people wanted, I mean, there were headlines about mm -hmm. it. The, uh, the, what was it, the 40 millionth baby was posted all over the, the news. Uh, I mean, it was, it was big, big news yeah. that the Latino community had reached 40 million, that the, well, that the community the had, had grown to a point where it was the fastest growing Fast, segment yeah. of, the, of, of the American population. And so a lot of people started to rally around that. But yes. then you began this research piece about, well, th there's a perfect storm brewing here. There, there are some significant yeah. hurdles that, that we're going to need to begin to clear. Well, if you think about growing up in the 80s and the 90s, when you were still a pop, part of a population in the, in the 20s of millions, or closer to 20 when we were coming up, um, you have to understand that the notion of being number one at something or a number two, you know, it's was really like a, was a really exciting thing. Yeah. The population growth to us was like, we won! Yeah. But what did we win? We won more responsibility is what we won, you know, and that's right. the truth. Uh, a greater responsibility to prepare ourselves for the future growth that was coming. Because remember, we went from closer to 40 million with it by 2000 yeah. to much more than 50 million in where we are today. Mm -hmm. Did we develop uh, a level of success in education that matched all this growth in the last 10 years? No. no. Did we develop infrastructure organizationally to match this growth? No. Did we invest a proportionate number of resources to grow all aspects of this population to be able to work with itself locally, regionally, and nationally or internationally? Nope. We didn't do any type of early preparation to discuss what life was going to be like after these kids were graduated from college. We didn't do anything. Well, see, one of the most interesting pieces yeah. of, of, of the research to me is, is when you begin to kind of lay the groundwork and you say, look, yes, we, sh we can be excited, uh, but there's a lot, like you're saying right now, there's a lot of responsibility that comes mm -hmm. along with it. And then you begin to, to lay out these tenets in the Perfect Storm research uh, piece that, that you authored. And you're beginning to talk about, first of all, education, and then mm -hmm. you begin to talk about a leadership vacuum. Yep. And then you talk about a civic organization vacuum that exists that all needs to be addressed over the course of time. And you kind of leave it open-ended mm -hmm. so that you say, and if not, it, we don't know what may or may not happen. And, and it's almost like eight years later, with all the frustrations that people are having with, with the debt ceiling. And you know, last week, I, we, we had a great group of under 30 mm -hmm. bright young men and women working for Congressman Silvestre Reyes at his, as his senior staff members saying that their experience was somehow, um, well, the, the exception and not the norm educationally in El Paso because of certain things that they had done outside of school. And so it, it's kind of interesting to me that, that this research piece begins to say, okay, there's, there's certain things that we ne need to begin to hit. And, and educationally, you had some interesting numbers. Right? Well, I, I would just point out one thing about the, if they were under 35, they graduated from high school in the 90s, and they were under yeah. the Clinton administration, and they benefited from a range of multicultural initiatives from stemming from the campus to the college admissions office within the high school. There was a totally different uh, opportunity available for that generation of staffers that you were mentioning than there are today. Um, but I would because say of that, the same population. Yes, shift. and I would say, yeah, there is an exception if you compare then to now. But if you look back then, it was common. And that's why you and I are where we are uh, based on our educational success. Because we come out of a whole generation of people that were graduating in high school in the mid-90s and finishing college around the turn of the century. And we really did have a tremendous set of, of, of aptitudes and attitudes that really promoted success in higher ed, rapid degree completion, and service to the community. Tell me about, about the numbers and how they're faring today. I know that when you were talking about the perfect storm, one of your biggest highlights was that back in 2003, after conducting a, a survey of a group, a cohort of students, you found about 2.4 million Latinos in high school in America back then that, that you actually uh, tried to follow through. And of the 2.4 million, about 1.3 million ended up uh, graduating high school. Uh, which, which is over 60%, not bad, I, I would say. I, I don't know how you feel about that, but where are the numbers today uh, in comparison to, to, um, to then? There has been improvement. 
um, which I think all of us are proud to say. Just like with the, hey, our numbers have grown. We're number, we're number two. <laughs> um, I think we're always proud to say that, yes, there is improvement in uh, both high school completion rates and uh, immediate college enrollment rates. And the news of last week was even highlighting how much more Latinos in this country are uh, basically successfully enrolling into undergraduate degree programs. Now, the issue, though, that I don't think I raised very clearly eight years ago, yeah. but that I would raise now would be, well, what are we defining as success? So they finish high school. Does that mean that they're ready for the world 10 years from now? Or well, were they ready for the world 10 years ago? Well, did the American education system even prepare the other well, communities for leadership so we, today? Just, I, just before we even start now. defining the metrics of success, I think you know, some of the numbers that we're talking about, we can say, yeah, we're, we're doing better. But so how, we're doing how, better yes. in high school completion. Yes. Here's, here, but here's the number that shocked me. And, and I, I'd be curious to see if, if the number has changed. The, the number that shocked me back in 03 when you first authored The Perfect Storm, and I understand you're, you're working to, to develop some updates to, to that piece, you, you mentioned that of the 1.3 million students that could have gone to college from the Latino Hispano yeah. community in America, yeah. only 147,000 that, that, that you could track actually chose to go to college. I mean, that, that's, that's a... It's, it's a scary, you start looking at some of those numbers and you have to remember that you have to triangulate data from the census, uh, from the National Center for Education Statistics, and then there's also regional variation in how you measure a right. successful graduate uh, of high school. Um, and, you know, the numbers I was looking at in 2003 uh, were based on 2000 uh, data. Yeah, uh, the, recent the census then. Yeah. yeah. And since, have a new census. Yeah, and since then, there's a few shifts in how certain things are, are calculated, but um, we knew then that our under five population was massive. Yeah. And now we are watching you know, the same kind of growth go from kindergarten through eighth, now really kind of mushroom out into high school. So yes, we're improving our, our high school completion rate, but there's more Latinos in there. There should be more. We are still neck and neck with African-American students. And that's an, um, uh, a threshold where I think both populations look and see how can we improve this uh, more rapidly within the next five or ten years compared to the last ten or twenty. How does do we it, continue the success? Does it concern you that that in the entire United States, I mean, it, it isn't even the entire population of an El Paso or a Las Cruces. I mean, oh, when you start I mean, talking about you, who's graduating, <coughs> yeah, I mean, you you start to say only well, 147,000 chose to go to well, college. I mean, we haven't about, even gotten to the but part. But think about the degree holders. Graduates. The degree holders. Undergraduate degree holders in this country that are Latino are 2.1 million. That's like the El Paso, Ciudad Juarez, Las Cruces area. Yeah. If they were all degree holders, they'd be representative of the United States Latino uh, intelligentsia, or at least the, those that are holding a, yeah. a post-secondary degree. Yeah. That's, uh, let's see, that's, you know, that's, that's less than 1% of the national population, they're closer to 6%, 0.6%. And you look at that for a second, you're like, imagine if you actually supercharged a fraction of the El Paso, Ciudad Juarez, Las Cruces area to, to redevelop America in new ways in preparation for tomorrow. I'm trying to say that we are sitting on top of so much talent as a community that most others look at their mineral deposits or their access to solar energy or something. I'm saying our energy, our creativity, and all of our future innovation is sitting in classrooms right now being understimulated, and we have a perfect opportunity to coalesce as a community, to grow our leaders, our entrepreneurs, our ambassadors, our community liaisons, you yeah. know, and the people that will make America that much stronger in the years ahead when you and I are getting closer to retirement age. What people forget is that if the average age in the Latino community is so young, then when there's guys like you and me in our early 30s, we're actually community elders, especially when we become <laughs> I mentors. think a lot of people would challenge that. Well, no, no, no. But look at how large our 65 and, of, uh, and above population is, 2.5 million people. It's tiny compared to the rest of the Latino population. So all I'm saying is uh, you look closely at who we have. I mean, there's twice as many kids that are, under the, uh, that are 18 to 24 as there are Latino seniors who are 65 and above. We have a tremendous responsibility on how we grow this talent and how we learn from our elders. You know, one of, one of the things that you brought up is, okay, there, there's, there's certain leadership vacuums, and that was your second tenet yes. of, of, the, of the perfect storm. And before I get to that tenet, I, I, I would suppose that probably one of the basic foundations of, of a sound leader is not only for them to be connected to their community, but also to be well-educated. Highly of, educated. And, and of the 147,000 that, that you uh, quoted back then in 03 in, in the perfect storm, 45,000 of them actually completed within the time span that they're supposed to complete. From high school years to, or yes, through that period of time. What associates. is really important to remember is that when we were younger men and we looked at the future, we could not believe that there would be a moment in time where four year degree programs would be eclipsed by two year degree programs. 
And we were shocked then in 03 to see the rising enrollment levels of two year degree programs because we would question them. Yeah. What do you do with this? What happens if your whole market's saturated with this type of certification? Wait, how what are you getting for what you're paying? How many years are you taking to complete it? Are you transferring that two year to a four year? And, and steadily in that presentation, you see how few yeah. actually finish a two year degree program and enter into a four year pathway and then finish that four year pathway. Now, don't get me wrong. I have met extraordinary students all over Texas and different parts of the country that took a different route to graduate school and many did start in community college. And I feel like if you are a, a, a student who really has the motivation, you'll go through that process. But overall within the Latino community, we, the numbers do not confirm that increased enrollment into your programs is leading to a higher skill, a higher paid professional or, or, or better certified your student. Your numbers are, are sobering though, <laughs> Joseph. I mean, you, yeah. you talk about, you're, you're saying that back in 03, you were already projecting that of these 2.4 million, only 45,000 of them would yeah. graduate from a, with a four-year degree yeah. uh, for the entire nation. When, when the nation of is- Of that cohort. Of that cohort. When yeah. the nation is busy celebrating, hey, we're moving on up. Yeah. We're, we're, we're getting to different If places. you remember the report, there's a line in there that's like, we, we're developing this gargantuan body with a very tiny head. You know, like if you really <laughs> think about it, it was like a Frankenstein, right. you know, a golem, you know, that if, if left unchecked, there was going to be two things that would happen. One, there would be massive balkanization within the Latino community. That was a big concern of ours. Right. But that in the end, if we grow too uh, much of a, of a population that has a, is locked into a cycle of endemic poverty or undereducation, that it would begin to sap the overarching system of resources. Yeah. And that's higher cost. And higher cost in places like Texas equal a drain on you know, other resources. And in the end, do we want to see a rapidly growing Latino population becomes something that leads to a lower quality of life within any community, let alone nationally. So, so what? So you're already laying the groundwork to say, either we do something about this, or these are some of the the consequences we may we may begin to see. Eight years later, there's there's all sorts of conflict when it comes to the economy. Mm -hmm. A lot of people talking about how the debt ceiling, this, the debt ceiling, that, the tea, the the surgence of the Tea Party movement, and more yeah. independent. Uh, kind of mindsets that do not want government meddling. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of people thinking, you know, it's the economy, stupid. Just like it, uh, back to the 1990s. It was, a big, it was a big quote back in the 1990s. Here, here we are now with the Latino Hispano community projected to encompass between 40 to 70 percent of America's purchasing power between now and the year 2040 or something yeah. like that. That's huge. Um, but that's equivalent, to the, that's the equivalent to their share of the population. So you're but, saying that it's I'm saying bigger? that if you're watching a population go from 16% to 20, 20, you know, or 20, 22%, and you're watching the same growth of, of what they're, you know, purchasing, yeah. yeah, it's come to a point where Latinos used to really become like an auxiliary or secondary, you know, tertiary market. Yeah. Our whole future nice. rests on how they shop and how they purchase and how they use all type of, uh, types of different new services. Yes, I, I mean, I'm not surprised. So talk about that future. I mean, what does this mean? I mean, look at, based on the numbers you're looking at, yeah. it seems like we're at a fork in the road. What, what do we face in terms of leadership? What are kind of the, the, the pitfalls of it? But how can we perhaps be able to, to rise to the occasion? A lot of people yeah. talking about leadership. We talk about it on this show. We didn't, eight years ago, we, we didn't close our perfect storm presentation very well. Okay. Because if you hear that our kids are grow coming out of college at the rate that we need. That's like a punch in the kidney. Right. Then you hear our thinning leadership base is about to retire and disappear. Another punch in the kidney. Another punch maybe to the other kidney or to the spleen. And then you take another chop to find out that your organizational infrastructure, oh, it is just decaying, falling apart, and new organizations only live two or three years. And you begin to go down the list. People, if you recall, were ill at the end of this presentation. At the end of the Perfect Storm presentation, yeah, there's a slide like with lightning bolts you know, striking the earth and there's... Which you inserted yeah. as your presentation. But I would say <laughs> eight years ago, as a younger person, still in graduate school, yeah. my attitudes from my academic training were much more to look at a problem and then to define a solution. Right. Now, you and I have both evolved, you know, a lot since then. Yeah. And our opportunity is not to be problem driven, yeah. but to be, rec you know, at least alert and much more aware of the abundance of ambient resources that we are not activating yet. 
And, in, in your opinion, what are those resources for the community regionally? And, it's and, our youth. And it's our youth. It's our it's our numbers. It's the it's 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 our our cultural fabric. It is. We have all types of advantages that are actually very traditional American advantages that have just gone away from other groups. We seize those now, and instead of like allowing a balkanization to occur either generationally or according to citizenship or language or whatever, no, 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 no. This is a perfect opportunity to grow cohesion within this population and across the United States because everyone is embracing some form of Latinidad. You can't avoid it at this point. We were from a generation of yesterday in the Cold War where we were assimilating into something else. With the proportion of Latinos in this country, particularly as being the dominant forces at, at schools, at public schools, they are redefining the cultural fabric of the next generation. And their consumer patterns and their appreciation of dual language markets are, are all the new, the new innovations that they're about to take a hold of. We are, we're supposed to learn from them. And so I feel that our talent and our buying power and our future leadership is all together, tied together with one of the resources that the National Hispanic Institute helped you and I appreciate the most. The talent in our community that is literally with, within arm's reach. That if we take advantage of our own creativity, we'll find new ways to grow them. And in El Paso and Ciudad Juarez and Las Cruces and in this region, we are so young and we have so much talent that we really can uh, redefine not only the border region but the rest of, of North America. I, I personally see this community in particular, um, the Las Cruces, El Paso, Ciudad Juarez area, as, as, as a capital, an international capital of that for the Latino Hispano community. I, mm -hmm. I, I really do see it that way. I think that we're at a crossroads here where, where you could really experience a microcosm of perhaps what the rest of America is going to begin yes. to develop. Yes, and, we're, and we to are in a, a, a time traveling vessel, <laughs> believe it or not. We are broadcasting from the future. Uh, people don't seem to understand that. We are disproportionately uh, Latino here. We are very young and we have a lot of success with being disproportionately Latino. So theoretically we are at a point where maybe Texas will evolve to 30, 40, 50 years from now and, and the rest of the country a little bit later. So if we think about that just for, for just a second, what are we doing well here? You know, we can extrapolate so much from that and share it with the rest of our region and the rest of the borderlands and the rest of Texas. And we can help communities that are going through rapid Latino population shifts take advantage of our knowledge from Las Cruces, El Paso, Ciudad Juarez, and develop a different type of expertise and have greater success in a shorter period of time. One of the, one of the things you bring up on your, on, your, um, on your research piece, uh, on the perfect storm, you say that at, there's a particular moment in time where you, where you can begin to look at the number of, of people that a civic organization will serve <laughs> and that it's about yeah. approximately 28,000 people. And, and of a small, medium-sized, Of, of size, one yeah. medium-sized yeah. nonprofit organization. And that, that, that if you were to take that litmus test and, and apply it to the rest of the country, we're, we're in a vast shortage of civic organizations yes. and we're in a vast shortage of, of leaders as well because if you, I think there's a graphic that you put up where you say, look, for every as we uh, grow, so, many, yeah. so many people, you need one qualified leader. And, yeah. and you know, if you're to apply, I think it's one to 150, right? Yep. So if you are apply, if you're to apply those, those formulas to our data, both regionally and lo yeah. regionally, locally, nationally. statewide, nationally, however you want to do it, we're in a vast shortage. How, how does El Paso position itself uh, to, be, to begin to, to, to respond? What, what are some of your pieces of advice? Because well, a lot of people no, are saying, the, our leadership is horrible. Well, how well, does it? Well, you know what? I mean, there's a critique, the critique of elected leaders that you're going to get no matter what. But then there's a whole other tier of community leaders, which are pretty dense in El Paso. Some that are from the baby boomer generation, some that are that are actually younger than us, that are doing quite well. If El Paso is a microcosm of the U.S. Latino community and we're broadcasting from the future, um, what I find fascinating is, is, again, let's look at what's working, what's happening here. Uh, a few years ago, uh, through the National Hispanic Institute and Southwestern University, and you were part of this as well, we had a discussion about the nonprofit organization serving Latino uh, right. constituents uh, across the country. And it was a very, once again, it was much along the lines of the perfect storm. It was a really sad and sobering report. But the one bright spot was that all the new growth, the major growth within Latino organizations are geared towards women and their Latino organizations. And uh, one of the premier ones in Texas that is in Central Texas and in El Paso is called Latinitas. Mm -hmm. Latinitas is a great example of a women's based initiative that focuses on girls, in particular Latinas, Latinitas, mm -hmm. linking them to mentors and linking them to a number of early opportunities to discuss their future as 
you know, experts, leaders, uh, innovators, family members, key members of the community, you name it. You know, it, it is a whole new discussion, but there's a lot of activity and excitement about female-driven, Latina-oriented approaches for community development. In El Paso, you're seeing that. You're, and I'm seeing, you know, the, the older generations of the Lulackers, who are friends of mine, really struggling the way we were just as concerned in the perfect storm that here you have this very active set of youths from 40, 30, 40 years ago who are now in their 50s, 60s, or 70s, and somehow they did not remain as connected to the teenagers, and so there is this in-between zone of very limited numbers of, of alumni who can begin to fill those, those senior leadership roles. So I feel that El Paso is helping us to understand the future implications for the Texas Latino community and the rest of the country, but we have to look more closely at that and then discern lessons that we share so that we don't repeat the past. You, you and I are always uh, talking about a particular book by, by Malcolm Gladwell, and he talks about a tipping point, yeah. and uh, we're in the last minute of the show. Already. How, how already. I mean, wow. it, it, your wow. podcast well, hey, from the future well, that you call yes. kind of goes by in a flash, but in, in a few words, how, how, how would you say that El Paso, Las Cruces, Ciudad Juarez could contribute to the tipping point? Look, we, because uh, tragically, uh, the destabilization of Juarez has led to an influx of Mexican talent and entrepreneurial growth and youth and vitality that within two years has done so much in El Paso that I predict El Paso is really going to have a stimulus and, and really redefine uh, the borderlands overall. But it comes from our friends south of the border. Well, Joseph, the conversation can certainly not end here. I mean, folks, we, we talk about a changing America. We talk about the fact that uh, there are things changing today in our own communities that are going to just redefine what we call as the American experience. Folks, this conversation is certainly not going to end. Joseph, I'm going to have to have you back at Thank some you. point. Uh, and folks, we have to continue to talk about these things uh, as we continue to move towards a changing America. This is it from all of us here for tonight. We'll look forward to you next time. I'm Hector H. Lopez.